Welcome to our virtual combine clinics here at Altor for Ag Products. My name is Caleb Hari, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm also the Ag Marketing Coordinator here at Altor for. I'm excited for you guys to join us. 2020 has been a crazy year, but we're going to try this anyways. We're always excited about our combine clinics. We'd love to be able to shake your hand, have lunch with you, um, but this is going to have to do for this year. So we've got an exciting lineup. We're going to hear in a minute from our VP, Scott Humble, over in Clinton. We're also going to hear from our parts department. Rick Fager is going to join us, give us a few notes about our special that's going on. I know it's running now uh, through the end of next week. I believe August 21st is the last day for that, but he'll give us a few more details. Then lastly, we're going to have Jeff LaCour and Jeff Gray. Uh, always great to hear from them from Kloss. Uh, they're going to give a walk around on this uh, Lexian 8800 and uh, give us some good pointers so that we're ready for harvest this fall. Uh, at the very end of that, we're going to have question and answer time. So if you have any questions, put it in the chat feature there. Uh, if we can answer them on the spot, we'll do that through chat. Otherwise, we'll collect those, give those to uh, Jeff and Jeff, have them answer anything that you have. Um, and then finally, a few housekeeping notes. We, uh, if you have any tech issues, um, we're going to post um, any notices on our social media account. So stay tuned to Facebook if you're having troubles. Uh, as well as the website that you guys registered on. So a quick, easy way to get to that is altorferag.com slash events. And uh, I'll be monitoring that. I'll post any notices we have. We also have a question form on there. If you're having troubles, put questions in on there. I'll monitor that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Scott Hummel, our Vice President of Ag Division, and uh, we'll hear from him. Hello, my name is Scott Umble, Vice President of Altor for Ag Products, and on behalf of all our employees, I'd like to welcome you all to our first virtual combine clinic. We sure would like to meet together and be in person as we typically are annually, but this year has provided some challenges to say the least. But I'm very proud of our employees for taking on those challenges and creating a uh, very similar type of format and instruction that you're accustomed to seeing, but in a virtual format. This format would also allow you all to reference it later via YouTube or other means. Uh, at the end of the uh, training, you will have a live Q&A, and we very much encourage you all to interact and ask questions that are on your mind. And after that, you'll have an opportunity to provide feedback on how we can improve, things you liked, things we could do better. We very much uh, want that type of feedback, and we appreciate this, and we want to make it about you. So with that said, thank you all for attending. Good luck this harvest, and be safe. Well, thank you, Scott. I appreciate the welcome, and yes, we are excited everybody's here. Um, before we jump in with Jeff and Jeff to do a walk around on this, uh, let's hear from Rick Fager, who's also over in our Clinton location. He's going to tell us about our part specials. Rick? Welcome, everybody. My name's Rick Fager. I'm Inventory Control Manager based out of Clinton, Illinois. A couple of parts points we're going to touch on today. Uh, we are making sure everyone is signed up on Parts Doc, which is our electronic parts catalog. Uh, it's the same catalog that we use at the parts counters at all of our locations. The other thing that we're pushing is our part special right now that runs through August 21st, 7% discount on Kloss, Capello, and Macdon heads. We are also focusing on our Kloss lubricants um, now that we have available through Kloss. And we also have some toy combines in here um, for the people that are collectors or for the people with children. Um, we can be reached at any of our stores, 877-228-7278. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. And again, take advantage of our part special going through the end of next week. August 21st is the last day to take advantage of that for Kloss, Macdon, and Capello Parts. So we're back here with Jeff. And Jeff, uh, we've got the combine opened up, ready to do a walk around. And uh, to start us off is going to be Jeff Gray. I'll let him introduce himself and uh, we'll see what he's got to say. Thank right. you. Thanks, Caleb. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Gray. I'm the product manager for field support for Lexian Combines. And what I want to do now is I want to take you around the, uh, the walk you around the combine and hit on some of the uh, uh, finer points of uh, getting these machines optimized for a, a very productive fall. So we'll talk about tips and tricks, adjustments that you need to make, and the right, uh, right configurations as well. So let's go ahead over here to the feeder house, and we'll start right out here in the front. Uh, one thing before I get started on the feeder house, though, uh, uh, 
whenever we start working on the combines, make sure that we've always take safety into, into the number one consideration. So before I do anything around the feeder house, I always make sure that I have my feeder house stops in the down position. So uh, that uh, makes for a much safer environment. So the HP feeder house, uh, so uh, the first thing on the feeder house is the drum. And uh, the position of this feeder house drum is very important. You'll notice this one is a little bit different uh, than some of the other ones in the past because it does not have chains, it actually has belts. So this is uh, available now on the new series of combines, but everything I'll be talking about on the feeder house is universal for both 700 series, even 500 series, as well as on the new combines. So, but real quick, while I'm talking about the belts, this is the, the, the premium configuration for the feeder house. It has a uh, much quieter operation uh, than what the chains do. You don't get that metallic rumbling sound as the chains go around the drum. Uh, so it is much quieter, makes for a much quieter environment in the cab, so more comfortable for the operator. Uh, if you do have to change it, it is done the same way as a chain. You just break the master connects right here and then you just thread the conveyor out and thread in the new one. So maintenance is basically the same, whether it's belts or chains. Um, position of the drum. Um, I always like to run the drum in the up position as much as I can. Uh, that uh, puts less stress on the crop. That allows the combine to take in a higher volume of material. Uh, but if you, do, if you are gonna be operating or harvesting in conditions where you do have rocks or other foreign debris, this is your first line of defense when we're cutting soybeans to have this drum in the down position. So, but if you can get away with it, I recommend keeping it in the up position as much as you can uh, just to help out flow and uh, be, put less stress on the crop. So, uh, and it doesn't really matter what type of he uh, platform header, whether it be a, a, an auger head or a draper head, it doesn't really matter uh, on, with the uh, feeder house drum, but keeping it up is the best thing. And that's less work that you have to do going from crop to crop. So it's already up for corn. Um, one thing about this, uh, uh, any feeder house is making sure the conveyor is properly tensioned. We uh, still ten we tension these new ones now manually um, whereas on the 700 series, those were hydraulic. Uh, continue to let that uh, tension hydraulically as normal. But on these new series of combines, we have made it a lot easier to get a wrench in there to uh, adjust those uh, 24 mil nuts a lot easier than uh, back on the 500 series actually. So if we move around here to the right hand side of the feeder house, if you do have to adjust the drum, your rotary adjuster for the left and the right hand side is, is right up here in this, just behind the face plate. Easily accessible uh, to rotate that, dr that block to position that drum in the up or down position. And as I mentioned before, it's best to have that drum in the up position all times unless you do have rocks. So moving on back, you'll notice uh, um, the, uh, the new lever on the side of this combine right here. This is the new rock trap lever. Uh, I think most of everyone is aware that the rock trap on the new series of combine has an ejector so that we don't have to crawl underneath the feeder house and dig it out by hand. It's actually done right here uh, out from under the feeder house. So all I do is I push down on the lever, opens the door, push it on further. The ejector rod pushes the contents out onto the ground, which makes it a lot easier to uh, get in there and change your grates or of course clean the combine out. Just flip it on up and close it. The, posi the, uh, the handle actually has four positions to get better leverage depending upon the, on the, on the person's ability. So right now I'm in the highest position and I can move it down different positions here. That would be the lowest position. So I'll keep it up here in the high position or if I need to put it down in the low position. Now, the lever just above it, this is a lever that's been on Lexian Combine since day one. This is the lever for the disawning plates, which are the lever-operated cover plates uh, underneath the pre-concave. So right now, when the, when the lever is up, the cover plates are closed. So you're, this is maximizing your threshing performance. So if you're using corn grates, in tough green stem soybeans, tough green pods, and you need a little extra help, you don't have the right grates up front, this is, I would close this off at that point. So just by flipping it up, by pulling it down, it opens them up, which is what you wanna run in uh, all the time you're harvesting corn, as well as soybeans when you're using the intermediate grates. 
uh, because you're not going to have the chance for pods to escape like you would if you're using round bar for soybeans or the large slotted ones. So this is a very convenient item, uh, used when needed. So if you do need to maximize threshing in tough to thresh straw crop or stem crop, just flip the lever up um, if you don't have the, the right grades. We'll talk about the grades here in a second. So I'm going to pull it back down like I'm going to harvest corn. So if we move back on around to the, this side of the combine, So right here on the right hand side, this is where we shift from high to low on the threshing system. Now on the 700 series, you, uh, you re pull out the reduction bolts and bolt them to the side of the combine for low range. And then you bolt the gearbox and the pulley together for high range. On this particular combine, the new series, we do that all from the cab. There is a button on Cebus. You just hit for high range or low range and it'll shift from the cab hydraulically and place that gearbox either in the high position or the low position. So you don't have to leave the cab to shift from, from corn to beans on your, on your threshing system. So keeps a, it's one of those more convenient items and anytime you can add a convenient item, that means more uptime and that's more, uh, allows that combine and operator to be more productive. So really simplified that over the 700 series. Now on the 700 series, um, keep in mind the condition of those bolts too. Uh, so when you're looking at those reduction bolts, they have a, a plastic bushing around them. And you want to make sure that that plastic bushing is still on there. If it do is not on there, you're going to get play in that gearbox and you're going to start to wear not only on the bolts, but you're going to wear on the threads inside the posts or inside the, uh, the gearbox where those bolts go. So you want to make sure that that, that, that plastic uh, bushing or sabot is still around that bolt. If it doesn't have it, you might want to consider getting new bolts uh, to replace that with. So, and also one other thing while I'm talking about that is on those bolts, uh, please make sure that you put both bolts in at the same time. So you don't want to, you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to miss one. Um, always make sure that when you line your tabs up on the gearbox, you line them up at the one o'clock and the seven o'clock position and make sure that the bolts, when you're going into low range, that your bolts go through the tabs and into the anchors on the side of the combine. If they, if they don't go through the tabs, the gearbox will, will spin around and the tabs will hit on those heads and uh, they might break those bolts off. Uh, or worse yet, they'll break the tab off. So keep that in mind when you're, that make sure you get those bolts in the right position. It's not a, it's not a complicated task, it's very simple, uh, but make sure you get them in the right spots. I do get a few calls every year uh, about, what, about someone asking what that banging sound is and it's that tab hitting that bolt. That's not a good thing. You wanna make sure that the bolt goes through the tab. And also, finger tight and then snug up with a ratchet. Do not use an impact gun on those reduction bolts. You, you don't want to. They will actually draw themselves in tighter when you get them in there finger tight and just snug them up with a ratchet. There's no need to use an impact gun. You'll always get them too tight if you do. And then if you have to remove them with a wrench later on, you might run the risk of rounding those bolts off. So on the new ones, of course, we've made it too simple. Just shift from the cab. Don't have to worry about messing around with those bolts anymore. So we'll move on back to the clean grain elevator. On the new combines, we've moved the primer down here to the, uh, the, just the back side of the clean grain elevator. Uh, that way you don't have to climb up on top if you have to prime it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's new on this new series. On the clean grain elevator, we still have the same moisture sensor and collection apparatus that we had on the 700 and the 500 series prior to that. What has changed on this clean grain elevator uh, on the yield monitor is the sensor. The new sensor that we're using is now a mass flow sensor versus the previous optical volumetric sensor. So the benefits of that, uh, of that mass flow sensor is accuracy. It's going to maintain the accuracy. Uh, it's going to have a better accuracy, but it's going to maintain it longer, so less calibration is required. A uh, couple extra steps at the beginning of calibration uh, to compensate for different flow rates, but after that, it's, uh, it's, it's going to carry on long into the season where only a single maintenance uh, calibration may be required as you, as you watch the, the loads go through the machine. So that is uh, new on the new series of combines. If you had the previous, uh, if on, a, on a yellow combine, the 700 series, 
the optical sensor, I recommend calibrating both of these at the beginning of the season, uh, but you'll need to uh, do a, a few more maintenance uh, calibrations on the optical sensor. Now, the one thing to remember on the optical sensor is watch for wear on the lenses. Uh, it's not, don't worry about the cloudiness. They're, that's going to happen. They're going to get scratched. They're going to get cloudy but the near-infrared light is able to pass through that easily and be picked up by the, uh, the, by the receiving sensor. So don't worry about the scratch or the cloudiness of the glass. It's the angle of the glass. So it should be concaved into the elevator, and then as the paddle passes by it, it'll actually clean it off. What will happen over time is as the paddles go by the, uh, the lens, is they'll start to wear at an angle, and that will deflect the beam away from away from the receiving unit so keep inspect that annually and my recommendation would be to change that after after each season put new ones on before you start the season that'll help out on the accuracy help out on the calibration uh, so i recommend doing that at the beginning of each season um, but on the new system uh, we don't have to worry about test weights anymore because it is mass flow it compensates for that on the go so it is actually an easier system to calibrate but keep in mind on the optical system uh, the ones that's on the 700 series and the 500 series stay on top of the stay on top of the maintenance on that lens make sure it's in good shape before you start and uh, and then everything should be good uh, as long as you stay on top of your calibrations and perform uh, uh, maintenance calibrations periodically throughout the season so let's go ahead and step back here uh, just shoot right here on this uh, if we can so the canister right here, for those wondering, this is your 3D canister. This is not a filter. Uh, here is your uh, fuel water separator. This is a filter. This is not a filter. Uh, I think most everyone that has a Lexion knows the, uh, the 3D cleaning system. This is our active slope compensation system on the combine. Uses a pendulum to sense the roll of the combine and causes that cleaning shoe to pivot inside the shoe and shake the grain uphill versus tilting. Uh, by tilting, we add, that adds more complexity. Uh, electric motors, uh, whatnot inside the, uh, and pivot points inside the cleaning shoe that we don't want. So, so this is the only apparatus added to the combine to enable it to compensate for, for slope up to 20%. So a very simple system, follows the combine, reacts with the combine as fast as the combine rolls right or left, this follows right behind it to keep the, keep the cleaning shoe up to pace with the, uh, with the combine. So very simple system, no maintenance required. While we're talking about the cleaning system, I happen to have a CB22 lower sieve right here. This is the new sieve, bottom sieve, uh, for all corn machines. Now the advantage of this sieve is its, uh, is its ability to clean the sample up. Uh, significantly over the previous deep tooth lower sieve. The deep tooth lower sieve is a great sieve. It's great for capacity. However, it leaves a little bit to be desired sometimes when it comes to cleaning because the large slots uh, in this area right here allow for some foreign matter to pass through. Well, basically what we've done with to, the, to the deep tooth sieve is we raise the webbing up higher to give it the capacity or to maintain the capacity of a deep tooth sieve with the cleaning performance of a frog mouth sieve. Now this is the best solution for when you're harvesting with CMOS automatic. Now all of the new combines come standard with this. If you have a 700 series that you have CMOS automatic on and you're not getting the grain sample quite as clean and you still have the deep tooth lower sieve installed, you might want to consider going to the CB22. Now CMOS will do its best to keep that sample clean, but there will be some foreign matter that will escape through the deep tooth lower sieve. Uh, so the solution to that is, is the CB22 uh, bottom sieve. It is universal. Uh, it goes to into any combine that's got a jet stream. Just make sure you've either got the standard chassis or the wide chassis version. But otherwise, the length is the same. So these are, are universal. So this is the CB22 lower sieve. So I'll move this out of the way. Now, back here on the cleaning shoe, is standard on the combines is the deep tooth upper sieve. And the deep tooth upper sieve is your inch and five eighths 
long fingered sieve that's great for capacity and does a very good job cleaning also. Uh, that's your primary cleaning, that's your primary catch pan on the combine and we give you a very large area, the largest upper sieve area in the industry to clean a large volume of crop, whether it be pure crop or very full of chaff, a chaff heavy crop like we might run into in a, in, a, in, a, in a green stem, moderate green stem situation or dry conditions where we start to get a lot of chaff. That sieve is perfect for, uh, for handling large volumes of material. Uh, so what you want to do, what you have the ability to do is deep tooth sieves gives you a little more flexibility. You can actually run tighter and, and slow that air down a little bit and keep that grain inside there while still cleaning. Now remember, our deep two, our, uh, the cleaning fans on a jet stream cleaning system are turbines. And the advantage of a turbine is they generate more pressure per RPM than a, than a scroll type fan does. So it gives you a greater range of adjustability on that fan speed. So sometimes we can run tighter on the sieve, upper sieve and run slower on, on the fan and do a, do a great, uh, great job. Um, you still have, the, have, of course, the flexibility of opening that upper sieve up and cranking the air up as needed for very easy to thresh, easy to clean uh, high volumes of crop. But if you do need to get in there and clean that crop uh, a little bit more intensively, you have the flexibility of closing a deep tooth sieve down tighter uh, and slowing that fan down and still have enough pressure to move the foreign matter out of the cleaning shoe. So that's one of the advantages of the Jetstream cleaning system in the Lexion is the combination of that turbine fan and the Cascade pre-cleaner. That Cascade pre-cleaner, that's where the Jetstream blast comes from and that Jetstream blast is designed to blow the, the majority of the chaff to the chaff spreader. So we get that overburden out of the shoe box and it's a lot easier to clean the larger particles from grain when you don't have the chaff acting as an insulator around that grain. So that's the advantage of the jet stream cleaning system is that jet stream blast that blows the majority of that chaff, the overburden if you will, get it out of the cleaning shoe uh, to allow the shoe to be more, more efficient. So that's, uh, that's why we still use the deep tooth upper sieve. That's the great advantage of having jet stream blast in your cleaning system. We don't have that chaffer style pre-cleaner. Our pre-cleaner is a cascade or a waterfall to allow that air to penetrate through the grain, force the chaff out, and do a much more efficient job cleaning. So if you need to take it to another level of cleaning, cleanliness, you can keep lowering that bottom sieve down lower and lower, and it will push, it will increase your returns, but it will also help you fine tune that grain sample in a more challenging uh, crop. Um, the one great thing on this new combine is we've enlarged the entire grain handling system on the machine. So, so as we do increase the returns, we have a larger clean grain or returns elevator to handle that. We've also changed the head on that elevator to uh, allow that material to pass through more efficiently down to the cross auger. And the cross auger is much larger as well. So the entire grain handling system from the cross augers underneath, the elevators going up, and the returns cross auger, even the augers in the grain tank are much larger, higher capacity on this, uh, on the new series of combine uh, than what we had on the 700 series. So we can, we, it does give us more flexibility on cleaning. Uh, but while I'm on that, uh, again, one of the best advantages of that cleaning shoe is it actually get, or of the uh, clean grain handling system that we've got, the much larger clean grain handling system, is it gives us, uh, actually gives us, lends more capacity to the combine by getting that grain out of the shoe faster uh, so we actually gain capacity through efficiency. So that's another nice thing about going from 6,000 bushel per hour clean grain handling system to an 8,000 bushel per hour. Not everybody's going to use 8,000. There's a lot of folks not even using 6,000 or 5,000. And you don't have to. Harvest what's comfortable for you. But the nice thing to know, you have the peace of mind of knowing that that large high capacity grain handling system is pulling that grain out of that shoe faster resulting in higher capacity through efficiency. So that's one of the best benefits of that new clean grain handling system. So let's go ahead and right here, I'll turn around here and look at the chopper real quick. Now this particular combine happens to have the standard chopper on the back so we don't have any active spreading. There's no power spreaders on this. This is a very simple uh, chopper. 
that spreads, spreads out to 35 foot. Um, we have added some conveniences to it uh, that were available on the 700 series, uh, still available on the new series. So my stationary knives right now are all the way out, which is where I would have them for corn. If I want to put them in for small grains, I can go halfway in or all the way in. Let's say I've got some tough green stem soybeans. Maybe I only want to put them in halfway. I recommend starting with them in the halfway position. Uh, you've got a knife every inch, a stationary knife every inch. So you've got plenty of stationary knives in here. Uh, so start with them halfway in. If you have to go, if you have to go uh, farther in to get a finer cut, go ahead. Uh, but the best, my best, uh, the best results are going to be when you have it in the halfway position. Uh, you're going to have a little bit larger particle that's going to fly farther. Remember, the larger the particle, the farther it's going to fly. It's going to have more mass and will be able to go out farther. Uh, the smaller the particles, when you get those down to like powder or dust, they're not going to fly very far, especially on a chopper like this that doesn't have any active spreading uh, on the tailboard. So my recommendation is to start at the halfway position. And you might even get into a, into a soybean situ harvesting situation where having them all the way out, is is giving you the the right cut now keep in mind that you've got some flexibility here you don't there's no there's no uh no one fixed solution so if it's dry enough and brittle enough just run on high speed and leave your chopper knives out if it's green you need a little bit more smaller cut go ahead and put them in halfway and if you really want to pulverize it go all the way in but it's going to take a lot more horsepower when you do that so my recommendation is just put them in the halfway position. So now this tailboard is all manually adjusted. Uh, so you just raise it up and down uh, right here on the outside lever. And then your door, your lever right here that uh, opens the back door so you can windrow. So it's a two, two stage adjustment. So I drop my tailboard and then I open my rear door. Uh, you can also have that as an option controlled from the cab as well, where it's all uh, on the turbo chop and the pro chop. Um, on uh, both the, the 700 series and the, uh, and the new 8000 and 7000 series. So that's the knives. Let's jump around and see how I shift this from high to low. Notice the veins on the back here. We have no active spreading capability on this one. It's just a very simple uh, adjustment. And underneath the, the, the tailboard right here, I have my levers to adjust the vein position uh, to make it go wider or narrower as needed. So right here on the, the back left corner of the combine, this is how I shift from high to low on the new series. Right now it is in high range uh, for small grains or soybeans. If I want to go to corn, I just pull on the lever and put it into low range. And then if I need to put it in neutral, I just bump it right into uh, the center position and then I've got it in neutral. So that's uh, then you can be able to free, free wheel the uh, the chopper, there you go. So right now, high speed, low speed, and neutral, and the chopper should be spinning. So very simple. That can also be had uh, controlled from the uh, cab as well. So so if you get the uh, get that premium option, uh, again another feature we do right from the cab that speeds up the uptime, gets you harvesting a lot quicker when you do it all from the cab. Otherwise, it's a very simple procedure, manual procedure out here on the back. So the chopper, that's a, it's a very simple system on the combine. Uh, we do have three different levels of choppers. Uh, we have the turbo chop that's uh, available on all the 700 series. That's the premium for corn and soybeans. Um, it's also still available on the, the new combines. And then we have the, the pro chop, which is available on the 700 series. Uh, which is now available on a corn version for the uh, the new combines as well, and that has is has the ultimate in active spreading. Uh, it actually pulses the crop to spray it farther. Uh, it has uh, radial deflectors that work around the spreaders, and what those do is it's like putting your thumb on a garden hose. It pressurizes that material to get it to spray farther and uh, and get push that header width. So it's, it's easily capable of going to 45 foot plus on the, uh, with that chopper. So if, if residue management is extremely important and you want to spread as consistently and as wide as the header as possible, uh, the, the pro chop is the solution for that with, in, the new, uh, in the new corn version. So that's available on the, on the, uh, on the new series of combines. So 
Let's go ahead and move on here. We're here over the toolbox. So up here on the unloading system on the combine, so a maintenance point here, uh, the, uh, the new drive on this is all belt driven. Uh, so we don't have the large, uh, large chain o-ring chain anymore to uh, to maintain we have two smaller 60 chains right here that actually uh, that actually run the the floor augers inside the grain tank uh, so um, we don't have to uh, we don't have to do that maintenance adjustment any longer you do have a belt that you'll have to watch all the indicators on the new combine are all tip to tip so there's no so there won't be any confusion as to how tight I should make the uh, the belts they're all the same like you see right there uh, on the 700 series we have the combination of tensioners uh, one question that oftentimes gets I get asked is uh, I had the uh, the clean grain belt slip alarm uh, went off and I tensioned the the, uh, the tensioner the belt tensioner and it's still going off. Well, the reason why it's still going off is there are three tensioners for the clean grain handling system on a 700 series or a 500 series. You have the one that is positioned just above and behind the high pressure valve stack, that's stage one. Then you have stage two, which is the one that's horizontal just above the toolbox which is the one most everybody tensions first because they can't see the other one, which is, it's not hard to find. It just is positioned right behind the high pressure valve stack. And then the third one is the one that's down underneath the toolbox. And so you don't want to miss them. So if you do one, you've got to do three of them when you get that uh, alarm on Cebus. That's one of the more common questions I get uh, because they just forget to do the, uh, to do all three of them, they do just one of them. So keep that in mind. Uh, the clean grain tensioner for this combine, those are right back here. And they're the tip to tip style, just like we see up here. Uh, so we don't have the, uh, the, the fixed idlers. They're more floating style idlers, uh, just like was, what was down, down behind the toolbox as well. So, uh, so we've made that a lot easier. And uh, up here on the, uh, on the chains themselves, there's no, uh, there's no half links or anything for this chain. Once they start wearing, um, how you know it's time to change them is when you look at the gold tube uh, sticking behind the bracket up here on your tensioners. So you'll see your bolt, and then you see the right angle bracket that the tube runs through, and then you see the spring. Well, once that gold tube between the bracket and the retention bolt, once that gets down to five millimeter, then it's, uh, then it's time to change those, uh, those chains. Not only these two chains, but the one at the top of the clean grain elevator as well. Uh, so that uh, makes that a lot easier. Um, so no less maintenance. We just replace them after, uh, after a two to three seasons of use and uh, versus having to maintain the, uh, the O-ring chain that we had before. So we've made it simpler um, on this new series. Um, on the O-ring style chains, uh, one thing to keep note of is uh, lubrication. That's another question that gets asked. Should I lubricate it? You don't have to lubricate it um, unless, you, unless you just want to get rid of the cosmetic rust that's on there. Uh, but really, it's not, it's not necessary because it's already pre-lubed and sealed in O-rings, with O-rings. Um, the only time you ever grease an O-ring chain is when you start noticing the O-rings have actually broken and are hanging outside of the plate on the chain itself and by the time they start doing that it's probably time to change that chain so I wouldn't grease that too much I'd put a new one on there and another way to tell if the chain is getting bad is if you happen to see on the master link if the uh, if the cotter pins are missing uh, that's because there's too much play in that chain and the mat and the plate has snapped off and cut those uh, cut those, uh, those cotter keys that are in there holding that plate on. So if you happen to see that one or both of those missing, it's definitely time to replace that chain. So, uh, so with these, once they get down to the five millimeter mark, replace those chains with new ones. So now I'm up here to the concave. Now you can see right inside here, the main concave. Now on the new combine, we've enlarged that uh, main concave. We've given a lot more threshing area 
especially on the front side of this main concave. So what you're looking at, how this differs from the 700 series, is that is another uh, concave that I can actually, segment that I can actually swap out if necessary. Um, on this combine, I just remove the two eight millimeter hex heads and I lift up on that section and I slide it out the left hand side and then I can reinstall a, a new style of grate uh, to match the conditions better that I'm going to be harvesting. But the advantage of being in the Midwestern Corn Belt, we don't have to do that very often. The round bar is very effective at harvesting both corn and soybeans, even green stem soybeans. And uh, so I would leave that alone. The only time I would change that is, uh, is let's say I did have a large wire on the back section and I wanted to change it out to round bar on the front or vice versa. Let's say I had round bar in the back and I was going to harvest a, uh, a very tough stem or straw crop, uh, which ordinarily wouldn't be a crop that we'd be harvesting in this region. But for example, uh, uh, folks out west that are harvesting a lot of corn and a lot of hard red wheat, they would have a round bar concave and then they would change the round bar in the front to a more aggressive uh, uh, wire style concave to help thresh that out. But the advantage of being here in the Midwest, we don't have to do that. We can keep the round bar, all the, all the full round bar wrap inside there, and all we've got to change are just the pre-concave grates. And I've got two examples of them right here. Now this combine right now has round bar pre-concave grates installed in the pre-concave area. Now I've mentioned pre-concave a few times. That is actually the secret weapon on Alexian combine because what's up front in front of the, in front of the threshing cylinder is the APS cylinder. Which is, your, uh, which is the impeller that actually starts optimizing the crop flow uh, and, and making it feed more smoothly throughout the, throughout the threshing system. So, and as it starts to work, what it does is, it, as it starts to sort the crop out, anything that gets separated at that beater or impeller or by the feeder house chain or in the header, anything that gets separated ahead of threshing falls through the pre-concave grate. And that can be as much as 30% on this combine, on the 700 series, the 500, and even the 400 series before that. These grates are all interchangeable from 400, 500, 700 into the new ones. So if you have a set of grates from past combines, they will fit in here. But the advantage of the pre-concave is, is keeping it open as much as I can because 30% throughput, that's a lot of capacity. So if I cl close my disawning plates, uh, to uh, then I lose some of that capacity. For example, if I'm doing soybeans and I close down my disawning plates because I'm using round bars, uh, I'm going to lose my pre-separation, but I'm going to get a cleaner grain sample. Uh, but if it may be a, a more delicate crop, seed crop, and I want to maintain that quality. So what I'm going to do is I will probably swap out to my 12 millimeter grate which will still give me the capacity I need in soybeans, but it's going to give you that, uh, that little bit more aggressive texture here to hull open those tough green pods, as well as, as kink those stems up and make them more pliable so they flow more smoothly through the, uh, through the combine. So a lot of advantages. So if, I have, if I'm going to do the same crop with the round bar, I need to close my disawning plates. I lose my pre-separation area, um, and uh, I'll get a clean sample. But with this, I'll get, still get a clean sample, but I don't get the trash going into the grain tank, and, I, uh, and I'm still going to open those, concave, those pods up a little bit easier, which could result in a little bit wider concave. Now, that's the advantage of using these, making sure I've got the right grates for the right crop and condition that I'm in. So these work great in corn. This is also the one grate that I am seeing more and more folks use for both corn and soybeans. So, so if you do use it in soybeans, you're probably going to have to close the disawning plates. If you're a stickler on quality, and uh, you'll probably want to put this grate in to keep your disawning plates open to maintain that pre-separation area. We rarely close the disawning plates when we're harvesting corn because you need all that capacity in corn. Corn's a high volume crop, so you want to make sure you get your 30% pre-separation right through the pre-concave grate. And these are the only grates that we ever change when we're going from different, between different crops and conditions. We don't change the main concave out. You can change the front section out if you want, but in the Midwest, corn and soybean rotation, even soft red winter wheat, we don't have to change it. We can use full round bar for that, 
and just change the pre-concave out to your soybean grate to do your, to do your wheat. So we've made it very simple. Um, it takes about 15 minutes to change these. We've actually made it easier on the new series because you've got that ejector rod on your rock trap. Uh, to push that material out so you're not having to get down underneath the rock trap and dig all that out by hand. So that is the hardest part of changing the grates is cleaning the rock trap. Once the rock trap's cleaned out, you got an impact gun, it's a very simple procedure. It takes about 15 minutes to do. So those are the pre-concave grates. Um, and it's very important. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big stickler on these grates because I'm all about best practices, best performance, best throughput. And over the years, the best way I've seen to get that is to make sure that we use the right grates for the right crops that we're in. Round bar is great. Round bar works great in drier soybeans. When we get into some tough green, we might need a little bit more texture in there. And uh, I always like to keep my disawning plates open as much as I can because that makes, sh makes sure the combine has got the most throughput. And it also, you want to get as much of that crop down as fast as you can, especially the delicate, more valuable crop like seed beans. You want to get as much of those down as you can early and uh, ahead of the prior to the threshing. And that's what keeping the desonning plates will do when using this grate. You can also use the, the slotted smooth grate too, uh, corn grates if you have those as well. Those also work in, those work great in corn. They also work good in, in soybeans, especially drier soybeans. Now, one of the questions that I sometimes get asked is, what about those pieces about the size of a pencil that get in the grain tank. Well, those pieces, that usually happens when you get in dry, brittle corn and the tops start breaking out of the plants and they, you're starting to ingest more of that plant, especially that upper stem. And sometimes those pieces, which are about the same diameter as a pencil, and are oftentimes about, oh, yay long, about as long as that slot right there. Well, one easy way to get rid of those is if you have your 19 by 40 smooth slotted grates, just put those in there. Get a little more mesh. They got plenty of capacity for that dry corn. And uh, so you're not gonna lose any capacity doing that, but that gives you that mesh to keep that, those pieces from, uh, from falling through and getting to the grain tank. Uh, so that's a, that's a great, thing, great way to get rid of those. We get that question asked periodically. So um, that should, oh, one last thing on this combine. Uh, because we do have a longer uh, main concave, uh, we still occasionally need to have a filler plate that goes in there for certain crops and conditions. Uh, we wanted you to have that benefit of, uh, of being able to use one of those, but not have to get, go in there and bolt it in and get dirty. So on this particular model, right now it's open. You can barely see the, the front edge of it hanging down. So if I want to close it, I just push in on the rotary handle rotate up and it closes, push in again, rotate down and it's now open. Open for corn, close it for small grains or at soybeans as needed. That's a tool there to use when needed. Uh, and corn again, like I said, keep it open all the time. Close it down when you're in small grains or tough to thresh soybeans when needed. That's what it's there for. And it can be either had as a manually operated function, or you can also get that one controlled from the cab as well. And all those features um, like this um, that are controlled from the cab uh, are also controlled by CMOS Automatic. So CMOS Automatic would also open and close that cover plate as needed if you had the hydraulic version on here. So it gives a little bit more, uh, more performance to CMOS Automatic. Uh, while I'm talking about that, one other thing to talk about on the separation area, we, didn't, we haven't talked about it yet because we can't see it. Uh, it's in behind there. The reason why we can't see the rotors is one, we don't have to, we don't have to change the grate configuration. It's a multi-crop grate that works for corn, soybeans, small grains, rice, edibles, grass seed. We don't have to change the grate. But what we do occasionally do is we close or cover those grates up and we've got rotor cover plates. Similar to that cover plate right there, we've got them running the full length of the rotors. So we'll have them either two on corn machines uh, covering the front two grates or as many as four. Uh, and on this combine, we can go up to five because this is a class 10 8800. It actually has six rotor grates versus five that are on the class nine and smaller combines. So the advantage of having rotor cover plates is they hold the crop in the cage longer 
to improve separation, optimize that separation performance. And the great thing about the rotor cover plates is they do it on the outside of the grate, not on the inside. So uh, compared to transport vanes, which actually flatten out to slow the crop relative to rotor speed, that can add some wear and tear to both the crop and the combine. We do it on the outside. So we just cover up the outside gr of the grate, hold that crop in the cage longer, put more of a spin on that chaff, which will drive more of that chaff out the back to the chopper versus down to the cleaning shoe, which actually will, you can gain some capacity that way in our cleaning shoe from efficiency by getting more of that chaff out of the cleaning shoe. But that's the, the, the two things that it does best. One, it helps in to intensify or optimize your separation performance performance, and two, holds that chaff and, e and meters it down to the cleaning shoe uh, so you're not going to overload the cleaning shoe, but as you put more of a spin on that chaff, it's going to direct more of it to the, uh, out the back of the rotors towards the chopper so you'll have less chaff volume going to the cleaning shoe. So a lot of advantages to those rotor cover plates. Uh, so we want to make sure that we uh, use those when needed and CMOS Automatic will use those as it needs to. So uh, the last thing to I'll talk about um, and that's your, your prep pan floors underneath the concave. Uh, we don't have shoe augers, we just have the removable crop floors. And, and you've heard me say every year, make sure you keep those clean. Uh, please make sure the combine is clean before you, you, uh, you uh, head off into harvest uh, or before you inspect it, actually. Uh, a lot of combines get put away over winter, uh, dirty, and uh, don't get looked at until the next, prior to the next harvest. Uh, it's always important that we inspect them. And while I've got the concave wide open, uh, open the concave uh, wide up, open, and look up inside there, and you can see if there's any damage. If there, and that damage, or hot spots as I like to call it, those can cause additional damage to the crop uh, because you're gonna get crop over crop, um, and if you've got a big dent in the concave, you might want to look above it on the threshing cylinder and see if there's any damage. So whatever caused that, uh, that dent in the concave probably pushed up on the cylinder. You probably got some jagged edges on your, on, your, on your rasp bar or it's bent and needs to get changed. So please inspect the, all those areas on the combine, especially those in the crop flow area, because not only do they impede the crop flow, but they can also cause some damage, uncontrollable damage that'll make setting the combine a lot more challenging challenging. Um, so the last thing I'll mention is uh, the combine, the SEBA system is a, is a great uh, troubleshooting guide on the combine. So once you've gone through around the combine, inspected it, you've got it all up and ready to go for harvest, all, it's all lubricated and everything's adjusted properly. Now go up into the cab and start uh, running it through its courses, all the settings on the combine, uh, kick your threshing and separation on, start loading different crops. And uh, as you do that, it will actually tell you if one of those systems isn't working properly, you'll get the alarm on Cebus as to which area of the combine isn't adjusting properly. For example, the, uh, the crop that I was in uh, last, last, the last crop I was in last year was soybeans and this year I'm going to go into corn. I've got my own settings loaded up that I like to start at for corn. Uh, so I, I, I've, set, I've, I've, I've loaded soybeans, so I've exercised all those features in the combine. I sped them all the way up, closed, started to close the concave down. Now I go and load my corn crop and it will exercise them the other direction at this point. But all of a sudden I get an alarm on Cebus that says speed not set for your threshing system. Well, what could that be? Well, last year, the last crop I harvested was soybeans, and it was able to load the soybean crop okay, but because I've still got it in high range, it cannot get down to that desired speed that I've got uh, for corn. So, got to go outside and, and shift over uh, to low range on the threshing system or do it up from the cab. So, those are some of the alerts that Cebus will give you, whether it be something as simple as not having the threshing system set in the proper uh, range or something else abnormal on the combine. It's a great uh, troubleshooting uh, uh, tool on the combine to put one, it puts everything, loads everything up, so it's going to put, it's going to work all those sensors and uh, it's going to tell you exactly where the air is at. So use that to your benefit prior to harp going into the field, especially after you've gone through and got that combine all adjusted and, and all lubricated up and new features in there and you've made some adjustments in the past. Get those things exercised and make sure everything's working correctly and harvest will go, go great. So um, that's all the time I've got. If you have any questions, 
Uh, please get a hold of Altorfer. We will have a, a Q&A session, a uh, live Q&A session for you folks. Um, there will also be some handouts that I'll be providing from the Combine as well. Settings and adjustments guide, as well as what I've talked about here during this, uh, this video. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot for, uh, for paying attention. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff LaCour, our regional service manager, and he's going to talk to you about some maintenance points on the Combine. Hello. I'm Jeff LeCure, I'm the Regional Technical Manager for the, for the Central Region here. And I'm just going to go over some uh, maintenance items and some daily inspections on the machine. Start up here at the feeder house, one of the things that most machines now have is a 200 kilowatt drive. Now a 200 kilowatt drive on these machines was developed for corn heads, so we could drive large corn heads and chopping corn heads. But it does require a little bit of maintenance. So, up here we've got a gear reduction box, here we've got a gear reduction box. Underneath here we have a cooler and a coolant pump. So most the, the uh, uh, daily or the uh, yearly maintenance on this is about 500 hours and most customers are going to get somewhere between 300 and 500 hours a year on their machine so it's a good idea change the gear oil and bolt these gear boxes before you start the season. Make sure that you get the, the air bled out of the system. So uh, this is actually in the correct position for checking the oil with the locks down. Go ahead and fill this system up with oil. Run the machine. Shut it off. Check it. Do that about three times. You should get all the air bled out of the system. But as a daily inspection on this system, make sure that you're checking it for leaks. Uh, these gearboxes get very expensive if you take them out and you run them out of oil. So as a daily inspection, Check and look, look the hoses over, look the cooler over underneath the machine, and make sure you have, don't have any leaks there. The other thing I'd like to talk about while we're up front here is the transmission. So on either side of the transmission, we have a set of disc brakes. That's how we're stopping the machine. That's how we're uh, helping turn the machine at times. And if we get stuck, we're using those brakes to transfer power from side to side. So we don't want to have a lot of dirt dust, debris, crop debris, build up on top of those disc brakes. Uh, they're open, they're set right on either side of the transmission. So it's a good daily check to get an air gun out, blow the top of that transmission off, make sure that the material is cleaned out around those wrist brakes so we don't have any build up. Uh, we do offer a system now if you have a 780, so the Mercedes engines was built with a compressor on there, so you can actually hook up this system. It has three nozzles that bolt to the top of the transmission and help loosen that dirt up. On a 780 with the Mercedes, you can have it running all the time. So it's blowing air and keeping the top of that transmission clean. You can install the same system on any other combine, run the air chuck out to the outside, and in the morning when you inspect it, hook your compressor up to it off your truck, blow that off and loosen it up, get your long nozzle out and blow the top of that transmission out. So if you have a question on that kit, please contact Altor for they'll be able to get you the part number for that particular kit. If you're getting a new machine this year, there's a break in for the tracks. Always a good idea if you got a brand new machine, get you a couple bottles of talcum powder, powder them into the inside of this track, that will help your drive lugs break in. If you forget, you get to the field, the second best thing is just good dirt, good clean dirt without gravel in it. Shovel three or four shovels in on top of that track, run the machine, that will help those lugs on the, on the uh, tracks break in. We'll move on back here to the uh, lubrication system. So if you have an older C4, you may have a Lincoln lube system. All the modern machines, uh, the C6, the C7, and this C8 machine use a Becca lube system. Uh, it's uh, pretty self-contained, it, it, uh, it knows what it's supposed to do, but you can make some settings on this. So on this new machine here, you can set it for a 50 minute interval, a 60 minute interval, or a 70 minute interval. I recommend setting it at the lowest, set it at 50 minutes so it's greasing more often. Grease is cheap, it's a better insurance to keep everything lubed. Uh, on the uh, Canister here, there's a sticker here saying what kind of grease to use. You can use EP3 
but we found that EP3 doesn't flow as well as EP2 grease. So while EP3 is a high speed grease, being able to get the grease into the bearing where it needs to go is usually more satisfactory. So I highly recommend the EP2 grease. Uh, this canister here will, will generally run you uh, pretty much, if you fill it up, it'll probably run you most of the season before you run out. So it's a really good system. If you start the machine up in the morning, you can do a manual lube. Always a good idea. Fire the machine up, get the, get the threshing system engaged, the header engaged, go ahead and do a manual lube. It won't hurt a thing. Just a good way to get things started in the morning. This new machine is a little bit different on the drive. So on this one here, we moved our rotor drive from the right side of the machine to the left side of the machine. Makes things a little bit easier and a little bit cleaner. But on the older machines, the, the 500 series and the 700 series machines, we used to have a big pulley, or we still have a big pulley up there at the top that comes off the main gearbox. If you look at that pulley, you'll notice it looks like a fan. It's got spokes in it, just like a fan. It's designed to blow air onto the engine gearbox and keep it cool. That is a maintenance item that you need to keep, take care of daily. Clean that pulley out and make sure it doesn't build up with dust. Uh, just a little trick, if you want to, you can take a tie band tight to each one of the spokes, let it stick out about an inch from the end of the pulley. Those tie bands flopping around on the inside of that pulley will help keep it clean. So keep it clean before you start the season. Make sure you check your engine gearbox for oil. Check for leaks, any of the, the pumps or the output shaft or the drain hose. Make sure you have no leaks on there. If it goes out, and they're very reliable. The only reason they go out is they run out of oil. So make sure it's checked, it's full of oil. The new machine has a sight glass on it. The old ones on the back of the gearbox is a check plug. You should have oil running out of that check plug when you open it up. That's the fill level. So we'll walk on around to the back of the machine. Uh, in the past, uh, the C4, or excuse me, the C6 and C7 machine wide bodies all had this four link axle on it. Now with the C8 machines, all our machines have a four link axle on it. The four link axle is designed to allow us to put a bigger tire back here and still turn sharp. The axle will actually move to the side to let the wheels turn. Important safety feature here. If you have a flat tire over here, you're going to change the width of your axle for any reason. You cannot just jack up one side of this axle. You have to put a jack under both sides of the axle. It is unstable. If you jack up one side, it can come out one way or the other from you. So make sure if you're doing any kind of work on this rear axle and this four link, a jack under both sides of the axle to keep it stable. We'll go around here to the uh, urea tank. So all our machines since 2014 use urea as an after-treatment system. It's very important. Most manufacturers of urea, and I say urea, AdBlue, BlueTech, Diesel Fluid, whatever you want to call it, it has many different names. Most manufacturers only guarantee their project for about six months. So after six months, it starts to deteriorate. There are some out there that guarantee it for a year. But I guarantee you, if you set your combine, parked your combine in the shed in November, by now, this urea has degraded. That means when it goes to do after treatment, it takes more and more of the urea to do the same thing. It'll get to the point where it can't keep up anymore. So a very good practice before you start season. All these tanks have a drain plug in the bottom of them. Drain your urea out and start with fresh urea. They also have a filter. This one's loaded right, is located right above the urea tank. If you've got one with a cat engine, it also has a filter on it. Change the filter at the same time you change the urea. You'll have a lot less problems with your, with your after treatment system, having fresh urea in there and a good filter. So uh, 
one of the things to, re to remember on, on this system here, uh, keeping it clean, ha being able to do its job. Uh, the, uh, the engines that we build these days are, are very good engines. Uh, I, don't ca I don't care who the manufacturer is, whether it's a CAT engine, a MAN engine, or a Mercedes engine, they're all very good engines. Probably the only issue we really have is the emission system, and part of that is just maintenance, keeping that emission system working correctly. This is an after-treatment system, so what it is, it's, it's, uh, it's taking care of the NOx. We have three different things we're trying to clean up on these emission systems. NOx, soot, which is basically unburned diesel, and hydrocarbons. The hydrocarbons are very small. The two things that this system mainly wants to do is clean up the NOx, which is nitrous oxide, and the soot, burn the diesel. So these engines run a lot hotter than they did in the past. So over from what we ran 10, 15 years ago, we run the temperature on these engines much higher. That burns off the soot. So that gets rid of the both of the unburned diesel. The after treatment system is there to get rid of the NOx because as we raise the temperature of the engine, we create more nitrous oxides. So with the urea system, we're taking that, that NOx that's coming through there. We've got a catalyst in there that has the, will capture that NOx. And then we put in the urea, which will turn that nitrous oxide back into nitrogen, which is, not, is about 78% of the air we breathe, and water vapor. So it's very important to keep this system running correctly. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was our EGR system. So most modern engines, again, will have a, an exhaust gas cooler on them. And basically what this system is doing is taking part of the exhaust and running it back into the intake. So we have less hydrocarbons and everything going back through the exhaust system. So to do that, we have to cool it down. We can't run hot exhaust back into the intake. We're basically running an exhaust pipe surrounded by coolant. On our engines, because of height clearance, our coolant recovery tank and our EGR cooler are almost on the same level. That's why it's very important on these machines to do a daily inspection. Check your coolant recovery tank, make sure that the level is full. And when I mean by full, it should be filled up to the neck. So you open the cap, there's a fill neck on there, bring coolant clear up to the bottom. It is not acceptable to see coolant just up to the sight glass. That is not enough. What will happen if you run at that level is you'll eventually burn a hole in that exhaust pipe that runs through that EGR cooler and then you'll start pulling coolant into the engine. So daily inspection every day, check that coolant recovery tank, fill it up to the neck. The other thing I'd like to speak about would be the engine itself. Make sure you get up there with the air hose, blow that engine off. Uh, these engines, this one here uses a big catalytic converter. It's sitting right beside the engine. We want to make sure that we don't collect any dust there, so keep it clean. If you have one with a cata caterpillar engine, you're going to have a diesel oxidation catalyst and a diesel particulate filter stacked on top of each other. Make sure you blow those off every day. They are very well insulated, but you can accumulate enough dust on there to cause an incident. So make sure that they're kept clean. Uh, I'll be here for question and answers, so I'm going to turn this back over to Jeff Gray outside and we're going to look at some headers. All right, I just wanted to touch on a few uh, items here on the Convio Flex Draper. Uh, this flex draper we introduced here two years ago, and we've had a lot of success with this. Uh, a lot of the features that we offer on this, the exclusive features like auto flex, auto belt speed, those are some of the things that customers have really come to appreciate. It takes the guesswork out of setting a header, especially uh, trying to set the cutting heights. Uh, auto flex just lets this header cut at the lowest possible cu cutting position continuously, so without the operator having to, uh, to adjust <coughs> or fine tune the cutting heights. But on a, a couple maintenance points here. Uh, here on the right hand side, when I've got the header hanging on the feeder house, I want to inspect the, the belt tension. So we have a tensioner like you see here on the left, right side, and the center. They're identical, no tools required uh, for tensioning the belt. So right now as I look at the indicator, I'll see the, uh, the, 
the two teeth need to be lined up on the green mark. So right now it looks like the, uh, the adjustable tooth is set a little bit to the back. So what I need to do is detension it. <clears throat> now that I've got it detensioned, what I'll do here is I will tighten up the spring. And then I'll slide it back on. And now I've got the two teeth lined right up where they should be. So now I've got the right tension for the right belt. Then I'll go over and do the same thing for the left side as well as the center. Make sure the two teeth are lined up in line with each other on the green mark. Again, no tools required. Keeps it, uh, makes it very simple. <clears throat> One other thing too on your drive lines. Make sure your drive lines telescope through properly. Um, so make sure they stay greased and make sure there's no, uh, no dirt or anything built up in here. So I just typically will disconnect them, slide, grease them and smooth them in and out so they don't, uh, so they don't lock into any one position. So they do have that, flat, that, uh, that, that movement in and out as the end divider moves up and down. So, so that's a good housekeeping thing on, on drive shafts. Now, one other thing, I've got my uh, trusty punch here. If I do happen to break a sickle and I need to get it replaced really quickly, we've got these holes conveniently located inside the, uh, the flywheel of the, the knife drive. So all I'll do is insert a punch and then I'll watch as I adjust the cutter bar position to line those, te those sickle sections right up, right in between the guards. That makes taking the guard off a whole lot easier when you get them lined up that way and then remove them. So if you pull the camera around here, we can take a look at that. So I just moved the sickle sections or the sickle bar just enough to get the, get the sickle tooth section right in between the guards so that the guard is in the valley between the sickle sections. That'll make taking the guard off a whole lot easier. Slide it off, change your sickle section, slide it back on. And how we do that is just a simple pry bar in the flywheel of the knife drive and rotate it. It gives you enough leverage. You don't have to go up and disconnect your, uh, your drive lines. Uh, while I'm at the cutter bar also, you'll see the standard rot guard. This comes on every Convio flex draper. It is removable, so if you do get into some really short crop, especially if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have any uh, rocks, you can actually take all these off, zip them off, cut that very short crop, or if that's what you how you prefer to cut, you can do that, and then you can just bolt them right back on as needed. They are, are removable. If you need to adjust the timing on your reel fingers, you can do that as well. Up here on the ends, you can see your lever right there on the right side, and then you also have another one between in the center. So another thing here on the right-hand side of the header before we uh, move on is underneath, underneath the header, you'll see the sensing bands. Now these sensing bands uh, are often shipped on brand new headers or they were left installed or installed while doing wheat. Those sensing bands are only for harvesting wheat where the cutter bar is above the ground. They are not to be used for soybeans. So what we want to do if we harvest if the head's new or if we harvested soybeans back in the summer is we want to make sure we get these uh, sensing bands removed. So how I remove them is I remove the two bolts right here and then that disconnects the sensing band from the little arm that's attached to the sensor. Take that off and use one of those bolts to lock the sen little arm that's attached to the sensor up. So as you, you push it up and then you'll see the hole in there, you can screw the bolt in and that locks that sensor out of range. What happens is if we leave this sensor hanging down for soybeans is when it goes all the way to the ground, it is not pushed up high enough to put it out of range. So we have to manually do that prior to soybean harvest because what will happen is we travel through the field and as the header kind of moves up and down to compensate for ground terrain, this one will also start flexing and that will confuse the entire auto contour system as to which sensors it should be looking at. It should only be looking at the sensors on the ends of the header when we're harvesting soybeans when the, when the header is on the ground. So disconnect this completely re and disconnect the chain and completely remove it from the combine, zip tie them all together and store them either in the toolbox or somewhere where you won't lose them. 
Okay, one other thing I want to talk about, and then we'll be finished on the uh, on the Convio, is this particular Convio was run on a standard chassis combine last year, either a 7400 or a 7500. And how I know that is because the center flighting extensions are still installed on that, meaning the swath that exits the header is narrow, which is consistent with the uh, chassis of a 74 or 7500, which is also, uh, which replaced the previous 73, 730 and the 740. So if I was gonna put this on a wide chassis combine, either a 760 or a 780 or an 8600, 8700 or, or 8800, I will remove these flighting extensions so that the swath that exits the header is wider, as wide as the opening on the feeder house. That'll make for much smoother, more consistent flow. That'll even help the threshing system out as that crop will be the widest that it, uh, going entering the feeder house, as wide as possible as it goes from the feeder house into the threshing system. Also, on your fingers, I can adjust the timing of these fingers on the back side over on the right end of the drum, there is a lever over there that I can push up or down to adjust the timing of my fingers uh, according to the crop conditions. So that's a uh, nice uh, right out in the open adjustment, not complicated to get to at all, so. Ready? Okay, and a couple other things you'll see out here on the header are the lights. Uh, those are your, uh, your, your, your table lights, uh, nice to have shining out in front of the cutter bar, especially in, uh, in, in when it gets dark out and you, and you are in a field that's got some, uh, got some foreign objects or rocks in there. That helps you see down here better when the uh, lights on the, on the cab might be overshooting the header and looking out beyond the header. These are great to have right out here in the front as well. So that's all I've got for today. So I'm going to turn it back over to Caleb. Alrighty. Well, uh, Jeff and Jeff, I appreciate you guys uh, helping, us, helping us out with these uh, walk-arounds. Hope you guys got a lot of good information out of this. Um, for our, appreci or our appreciation for you guys joining, we've got a giveaway. Um, Kloss has provided us uh, five Pelican coolers that we're going to give away. So we're going to draw for that here after um, both of our clinics are wrapped up. Um, you get one entry if you attended this, as well as another entry if you guys fill out our post-clinic uh, survey. Uh, give us positive feedback, negative feedback. We want your honest uh, opinion on how this went. We know 2020 has been a crazy year, um, and this wasn't maybe how we all would love to have done a clinic. Uh, it's what you know 2020 dealt us, um, but we don't know what the future holds. If we're going to have to do more stuff like this, we want to know how well this worked for you. Um, so give that feedback and then we will uh, notify the winners as well as send out a, a post uh, clinic email that's going to have links to this recording. Um, we're also going to provide handouts that Jeff has for us as well, uh, as, well as the winners. So um, keep an eye on YouTube. We're going to have other videos available with walk arounds with our technicians, product specialists, and Jeff. So again, thank you for attending. Um, put in all your questions. We're going to start our Q&A here in just a so moment um, and hopefully we can uh, answer any of those final questions for you. Thank you.